you know, our, uh, our IPKC mission statement states that our community exists to partner in the Great Commission by doing two things. The advancing of nine-day prayer and the proclamation of the beauty of Jesus and his glorious return. And uh, what I find interesting about that statement is that it, it really kind of coincides, I don't know if this was done intentionally, but it coincides with what it is that Bob Jones spoke of, in my opinion, back in 1983 when he first met Mike, and he spoke about this banner in the spirit that is over this region. And he said he saw this banner of prophetic and intercession. Prophetic and intercession in terms of that being the, uh, the primary, the two primary purposes of the movement that the Lord has birthed here in the Midwest. There are other assignments, but I believe that these are the two primary ones. The establishing of nine-day prayer and the prophetic purpose. Now, when thinking about the prophetic, I think of two things. One is the, what we commonly know as, you know, the word of knowledge ministry and, and, and uh, the predictive element of the prophetic ministry. But I believe there's more to the prophetic ministry than those predictive elements and the word of knowledge. It is related to the forerunner message. When we're talking about the 150 chapters that... Uh, Mike taught on for three years in the context of CBETS. I believe that is part of that banner, is part of that purpose of the prophetic. In the last uh, several years, our, uh, our spiritual family has been in a season of a reset, and it was to strengthen the sense of family, to strengthen nine-day prayer, to strengthen the messaging assignment. And that is part of what I, what I focus on tonight is this messaging assignment that the Lord has given us. Uh, some of you tonight may hear in some way for the first time a, a sense of confirmation in your heart saying, you know what, this is what the Lord has spoken to me about in terms of my assignment. And some of you may go, you know what, I remember having said yes to this and through the, um, you know, through the highways and the byways of life, I've kind of lost my way and and I feel a beckoning, a, a, a returning, a call to return from the Lord to say yes to this assignment of being a forerunner messenger. Now, when talking about these prophetic messengers, I'm not mostly thinking, again, about people standing on platforms. There are, the way I like to say it is there are, there are only so many platforms in the earth, but, but there are a lot of coffee tables, Again, there's only so many platforms, but there are a lot of coffee tables. And I believe that most of these forerunners, these men and women, that's where a lot of this ministry will take place. It will take place around the coffee tables and the dinner tables of the natures of the earth, conversing about the scriptures, opening up the scriptures, answering questions, asking questions, diving into the counsel of God, um, uh, uh, giving understanding and wisdom insofar as what it is that the Lord is doing in the nations of the earth. I remember some years ago, I was in, uh, I was in Cairo, Egypt, and uh, through a whole series of events, I ended up in someone's living room, and there were 20 plus uh, young adults gathered for a time of Q&A. And they all wanted to talk about what I thought about Israel. Now, how many of you know that talking about Israel in America is an idea? Talking about Israel in Egypt is personal. And it was, it was probably one of the most intense <laughs> Q&A sessions that I was ever a part of. And that's when it struck me. I went, wait a minute. I go, Lord. I've been thinking about foreigner messengers being prepared for the platforms, but really foreigner messengers need to be prepared for the coffee tables of the earth. Because you can preach and you can get away with a lot of things, but when you're sitting in close quarter combat with 20 people that are hostile towards your ideas, the, uh, the, the depth of understanding that it requires in that moment 
is very, very real. The necessity to eat the scroll. I, one of my favorite pictures about ministry is found in the very last chapter of Acts 28, where it says that Paul is, is in the, he's, he's under house arrest, but he's in his rented house. And for two years, people were coming and going. And he was going through the scriptures and he was expounding on the truth of Christ and the reality of God's kingdom. I think that that's where a lot of these messengers will find themselves. They will find themselves in this Acts 28 reality, one-on-one, one-on-two, one-on-20. Sometimes, yes, in front of the masses, but a lot of these one-on-one interpersonal interactions Uh, expounding on the word of God, helping people grow in understanding and comfort and wisdom insofar as what it is that the Lord is doing. And one of the reasons why I'm belaboring this point is because I don't want you to check out if you go, you know what, I will never stand on the stage. Because I really don't believe that most of, I mean, the truth is if you actually look at the landscape, you look at 150 chapters, and don't look like there's going to be a whole lot of space for stages. Okay, y'all completely missed that one. But uh, no, really. The, the, uh, that prophetic landscape paints an entirely different picture in terms of where so much of the messaging will take place. And yes, again, there will be times when the masses will gather, and there will be those that the Lord has uh, assigned to that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that purpose. But even those assigned to the purpose of standing before the masses still have a significant aspect of their ministry given to the one-on-one, one-on-three, one-on-twenty around the coffee tables of the nations of the earth. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus gives a warning and he warns about the issue of deception. Now, the deception that Jesus is warning about, I believe, is threefold. One, he warns against personal deception, where we don't, get, where we don't walk in deception insofar as our personal lives are concerned. But secondly, that, there wouldn't be, that we would not be deceived insofar as the message, the message of the gospel. And thirdly, that we would not be deceived or confused about the narrative in terms of God's plan and God's purpose, what, what it is that God is doing in the nations of the earth. Well, in Matthew 24, 6 and 7, again, familiar passage, Jesus talks about wars, rumors of wars. He talks about pestilences. You know, it's, and, and again, I don't, I don't know about you, but I just never understood how, how are pestilences related to the issue of deception in verse 4. And and then when we look at the last uh, two or three years, just the, just the, the amount of, of, of misinformation, and, and again, and by that I just mean just in all kinds of directions, misinformation in the context of a pandemic, that is a really a dress rehearsal of many more of these types of things unfolding. And Jesus says, see to it that you're not deceived in terms of your personal life, See to that you're not deceived insofar as the clarity of the message of the gospel. And thirdly, see to it that you're not deceived insofar as the narrative in terms of that we don't get confused as to what it is that God is up to. Again, as always, we are just living in an increasingly interesting and troublesome times. We've got the war of Russia and Ukraine. We've got China, you know, the rumors of wars about China and Taiwan. We've got just this brewing internal strife and crisis just in our own country. There is uh, levels of uncertainty. We, you know, we all smile big, but we all know the unsettledness that we feel in our guts when we go to bed at night going, oh, what is going on? And yet Jesus says in the midst of all of this that we don't, He says, don't be troubled. Don't be given to to anxiety and worry. And and that is actually part of the deception. A troubled heart is a deceived heart. Or a deceived heart is a troubled heart. And so the necessity to understand the message, the narrative, 
Growing in our intimacy with the Lord is absolutely necessary to not be deceived, to not be confused as to what it is that God is about in terms of what God is doing. There are three things I believe that the Spirit will do to cut through a troubled heart. He'll bring conviction, comfort, and confidence. The Spirit will release conviction, comfort, and confidence. Where did I get the conviction part from? Well, in John 16, verse 9, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will come and he will convict the world of sin, but not only of sin, but of righteousness. Not only of righteousness, but the judgment to come. We see later on in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 23, where Paul is talking to Felix. He's, he's actually having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Felix. And it says that he was warning Felix about sin, self-control, and the judgment to come, operating in the very three things that the Spirit operates in here in, in John 16.9. In other words, the Spirit doesn't only convict about the areas in our lives where we need to be changed, but he also brings conviction about the narratives that we carry about what it is that God is doing in the earth. He brings conviction about the judgment to come. I believe that is both the temporal judgment in this age as well as the eternal judgment. As we come into agreement with the Spirit, what happens is it gives us comfort. We gain comfort when we begin to say yes and amen to the Lord's leadership. It, bring, it, it calms our hearts. It settles the storm on the inside. And then thirdly, it gives us confidence. We have a different outlook insofar as where things are going. When looking at the crisis in the land, Titus chapter 2, verse 13 tells us there is a blessed hope. When thinking about the pandemic, Titus tells us there is a blessed hope. When looking at the wars and the different uncertainties that are happening in this nation and in the nations of the earth, the scripture tells us there is a blessed hope. In other words, there is a certainty of confidence that God has a plan and a narrative and everything is going to work out according to his purpose. It's like that old Al Green song. Some of you are a little too young to remember Al Green. No, I, I will not. You see, y'all don't understand. <laughs> you guys keep egging me on to sing, but you can't be doing this. No, brother, an inheritance hastily gained will not be blessed. And so... <laughs> And so, uh, y'all not ready for this stuff yet. <laughs> but, but, you know, but like Al Green said, he says, everything is going to be all right. He's coming back, just like he said he would. That is the blessed hope. And when we're talking about these 150 chapters, it is the blessed hope. It gives us an understanding of how God is going to navigate the end of natural history, climaxing with the return of his son, setting up his kingdom in the nations of the earth. And so that's what these prophetic messengers do. They proclaim the beauty of Jesus and all of the unique dynamics surrounding his glorious return. These messengers, they are called to, to carry the word of the Lord. And I believe that we're living in a time when the word of the Lord is rare. Amos uh, 8, 12 to, 13, uh, 12 to 13, the prophet prophesied, he says, there's coming a day where there will be a famine, not a famine of food, but a famine of the word. Uh, now, what I mean by there's a famine of the word, there are many predictive elements that are happening, and, and those things are good, but those are not necessarily the word of the Lord. And what I mean by that is that the word of the Lord is a message that energized by the Holy Spirit 
that produces a turning in the heart. I say this again. The word of the Lord is a proclamation of a message energized by the Holy Spirit that actually produces a turning of the heart. The Lord spoke to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 23, verse 22. He said, if they had stood, talking about, talking about his messengers, if they had stood in my counsel, they would have caused my people to hear my words and they would have turned them. The word of the Lord is a message that produces a turning. Yes, there are predictive elements that will be associated with it, but at the end of the day, the word of the Lord is a message that produces a turning. The word of the Lord is a message that marks the shift of a season. I'm sure that different ones of you can look back at a different time in your walk with the Lord and when you heard a message and you go, wow, that message shifted my life in a significant way. I've not been the same. I've not thought the same. I've not felt the same. I didn't make decisions the same way because of that message. Others may go, I can think of a message that I heard and I noticed that within the church, uh, things shifted. Oh, beloved, we are in need of the word of the Lord. These messengers, they are men and women who will have a vision for eschatological impact, eschatological impact. What do I mean by that? Their vision is to, yes, is to have an impact today, but they are looking at the end of the line going, I need to have a voice and an impact in the landscape that is described by the 150 chapters. We're talking about, for instance, about the most hard-hearted generation ever in human history. And yet the scripture promises us that that generation will be reached with the gospel and there will be a great harvest in the midst of that generation. And several times in the book of Revelation, it says, and they still did not repent. I mean, the intense shakings of God, and they still did not repent. And I love, we're gonna look at that in just a few moments. I love Revelation 9, 21, not love it because it's so intense, but Revelation chapter 9, verse uh, 21 and Revelation 10, 1 go together in a very, very beautiful way. Revelation 9, 21, it says, and they still did not repent of their sorcery, immorality, murder, and theft, and in 10 1 it says, and I still saw an angel with a rainbow on his head. <laughs> that even in the midst of the most heart hearted generation, God says, I am sending a realm of power, anoint messengers to reach that generation. That's what I mean by eschatological impact. It'll be a time for the greatest need of power. You know, guys like, you know, Dan Bohai and the rest of them, they got job security. No, because, <laughs> you're not gonna give that up, are you? <laughs> you know, so it's like when Jesus, <laughs> in, in Matthew 24, when Jesus says that there will be pestilences, you can insert in there that there will be an end time healing ministry operating in that context. So it's not just sickness and disease and we just kind of idly watch by. No, the body of Christ will be actively involved operating with apostolic authority and power, bringing healing in those moments. Apostolic power when it comes to deliverance. We look at passages like Revelation chapter nine, verses three to five, and we see the, uh, the demonic activity being released in the earth. That activity is, that is released in the earth is so intense, at one point for a five month period, 
people are so tormented by evil spirits, they want to die and they can't. What I see there is I see the body of Christ in those moments operating with the power of deliverance to break off the torment so that people would turn to the Lord. We're talking about the victorious end time church. Victorious insofar as the fruit of the spirit, but victorious in power. There are times we see in the book of Revelation where in the judgment of God, rivers are turned into blood by the word of the Lord. But in the midst of that, I can't but help to think of the prophet Elisha where there were times when he healed the water. Apostolic power. Micah chapter seven, verse 15, it talks about the wonders, the the power dimension of the book of Exodus being released in the earth. And I believe that it's the power dimensions of the book of Exodus. The apostolic power and authority that we see in the gospels and in the book of Acts multiplied and combined will be the realm of power that the end time church will operate in. In the midst of the reign of the antichrist and so forth. And so when we're talking about a vision for eschatological impact, that is what I'm referring to. Daniel chapter 11, verse three. These messengers, they will bring comfort and hope in the midst of great global emotional distress. I mean, there are many passages that talk about the anguish that the inhabitants of the earth will experience. Anguish, despair, deception. And in the midst of that, There is the end time proclamation of the gospel with power, with impact that brings healing, deliverance, comfort, hope, wisdom, understanding in light of what it is that the Lord is doing. That's why Daniel says, Daniel chapter 11, verse 33, it says, those who know their God, it says, they will instruct many and many will turn to them. They'll be intrigued. They'll be intrigued by, by the message And they'll be intrigued by the power dimension that is operating in the lives of these messengers and even the and ultimately the end time church. The word of the Lord is what points us to the first commandment, living lives of obedient love as seen in the Sermon on the Mount so that our hearts can live and stand under the pressure, paragraph B, stand under the pressure of the coming end time storm. I find it interesting that Jesus, when he talks at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, anyone who hears these words of mine and does them, he says, they are men and women of wisdom whose lives are built on a rock. And then what he does next, he describes a storm. He says, the rain descends, the floods came, the winds came and blew and it beat on that house. Amos 1.14 calls the day of the Lord the day of the whirlwind. Jeremiah 23 talks about the whirlwind of God that is coming. The end of the age is described as a storm that will come. And Jesus says, those whose lives are built on the principles of the Sermon on the Mount, they are the lives that will not be shaken. And he goes on to say later on that if you hear it and don't do it, he says, great will be that fall. I remember some years ago, I was living in Florida and somebody said some mean things about me, probably about three quarters of it probably was deserved. But but I remember being troubled, just pained and just really disoriented internally by the things that were being said. And so um, I remember going before the Lord and said, Lord, I go, why am I so rattled on the inside? I go, I, I help me. And he made it so clear to me. 
He said, that's because your life is not based on building, it's not built on the principles of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you do, he, he, he goes, you want to have an inward stability and tranquility? I go, yes, sir. He goes, you live your life based on the Sermon on the Mount. And so when we're talking about the word of the Lord, we're talking about a message that is energized, that, that turns the heart to the first commandment and to walk out obedient love as seen in the Sermon on the Mount. It energizes the heart, it envisions the heart, it strengthens the heart, and it sets us on a course to live in that way. Let's go to page, a paragraph D. So we need a vision for eschatological impact in the context of the prophetic landscape, again, as described by the 150 chapters. I believe that we're living in a time right now where the Lord is setting the stage to lead the church into what I like to call a global wilderness season. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1, John gets told by the angel that, he, that, he, that the Lord is going to show him the judgment of the harlot, and by the Spirit, he's being taken into the wilderness. There's a lot to be said about that wilderness. There's different prophetic allusions to that, particularly Isaiah, 20, uh, Isaiah 21. But for our purposes tonight, the Lord is creating a, He's creating a wilderness scenario in the earth for the church to enter into. A wilderness scenario. Now, when we think about the wilderness, no, we usually just kind of think of a dry season. Well, how you doing, brother? I'm in a dry season. I'm in a desert. And that's not what I mean tonight by the wilderness season. As you recall, Jesus was filled with the Spirit when he entered into the wilderness. And when he came out of the wilderness, it says he came out of the wilderness full of the Spirit and of power. The Lord is creating an environment, I believe, in the earth. The various geopolitical dynamics that are taking place in this nation and in the nations of the earth is creating a scenario for the church to enter into a wilderness season. It may go for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Who knows? Only the Lord knows. But coming out of that season will come a church full of the Spirit and with power, ready to oppose the Antichrist and his kingdom, preparing the earth for the return of Jesus Christ. The wilderness, there are several components about the wilderness that make the wilderness actually a positive thing. We're not going to take time tonight to talk about the wilderness, but I'd like to point to you a, a, a couple of passages Exodus chapter 3, Moses is in the wilderness, and in the wilderness, he encounters the burning bush. So the wilderness is a place of encounter. Galatians chapter 1, Paul is in the wilderness receiving the revelation of Christ. So there's a revealing of Jesus that happens in the wilderness season. Psalm 63, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I will seek you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. David is in the wilderness yearning for intimacy with God. There, there, there's an awakening of hunger for intimacy with God when we are in a wilderness season. Hosea chapter 2, I will allure you into the wilderness. You will no longer call me master. You will call me husband. There, there's a new identity that gets formed in the wilderness. This particular case, a bridal identity. Isaiah 40, a voice in the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of formation where prophetic voices get formed. Psalm 8.5, who is this coming up out of the wilderness, leaning on our beloved? In the wilderness, we learn how to lean and grow in our trust and confidence in God's leadership. Many wonderful things happen in the context of the wilderness. John the Baptist liked the wilderness so much he says, y'all got to come to the wilderness for my conference. Go to page two. The training of the prophetic messenger. The training of the prophetic messenger. 
Now, um, what we see in Revelation chapter 1, excuse me, Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, is again, we see this angel, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in just a few moments, but this angel, he comes with these various characteristics. There's a rainbow, it's a cloud. His legs are like pillars of fire. His face is shining. He's, he's coming with these character, characteristics. In other words, he's coming with these realms that the messengers are called to touch as they stand before the Lord. He carries these realms or these truths about the nature and the character of God that they are to touch as they stand before the Lord. John, John chapter 3, verse 29, a familiar passage. When John talks about the friend of the bridegroom, he says, the friend of the bridegroom stands and he hears. And this idea of the friend of the bridegroom standing, when, when John the Baptist is talking about standing, he's actually talking about a priestly function. Because it says in Second Chronicles that a priest, they stand minister and burn. So when we talk about standing, he's talking about a priestly function that the, that the primary thing that the forerunner messenger, the friend of the bridegroom gives themselves to is to stand before the Lord, to engage the Lord in that place of intimacy. By the way, that is one of the primary purposes, not the only, but one of the primary purposes for why IFKC exists. It's to be a greenhouse for these messengers to stand before the Lord. That there are elements that have been entrusted to us, and even in the way that by the grace of God we're being allowed to operate, namely called the sacred trust, is for the purpose to create an environment to say messengers can stand before the Lord until that day. And that day being until that day of commissioning or that day of appointment. It is one of the primary reasons for why we exist. This idea of standing before the Lord in a priestly way, a couple of examples. The prophet Elijah, when he goes before Ahab, he identifies himself in this way. He says, behold the God before whom I stand. He says, that is who I am even before one who's known to deliver the word of the Lord, he goes, Elijah, he goes, who are you? He goes, I'm the one who stands before the God, uh, before the God of the whole earth. Jeremiah uh, 23, verse 18, if they had stood in the counsel of the Lord, this, this priestly uh, 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 dimension of ministering to the Lord, even the, uh, the angel Gabriel identified himself this way. When, when Zechariah did not believe the word of the Lord from Gabriel, Gabriel said, hey, you're going to have a son. He goes, I don't think so. He goes, wait, what do you mean, I don't, what do you, mean you, don't, you don't think so? He goes, do you know who I am? He goes, I am Gabriel who stands before the Lord. The two witnesses, Revelation 11, it says, these are the ones who stand before the God of the whole earth. The friend of the bridegroom is one who stands before the Lord. And so this angel brings these realms or these characteristics, these truths that these messengers are to encounter through the word of God to be prepared to prophesy and to proclaim the beauty of Jesus and his glorious return. In paragraph A, there is an understanding concerning the mystery of the gospel that is sealed up for the end time church. Because in this context, when this angel shows up, the angel lifts his voice and he roars like a lion. And when he cried out, there were seven thunders that uttered their voices. Seven thunders that spoke. It's my opinion that these seven thunders will be dimensions of God's grace that will be released at the end of the age that will give the church the necessary understanding of the fullness of the gospel proclaimed with power resulting in the completion 
of God's purposes, Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, in a day when the mystery of God is completed. John heard what these seven thunders said. He was about to write them down, and the Lord said, no. And I believe that it's because it's for an appointed time. Now, these seven thunders, they will not be some, you know, who we will message out there. Uh, there will be messages that will be understood through the word of God, discerned by the global leadership of the body of Christ. It won't be some elite, spooky, you know, thing on the side over here. We're talking about an understanding of the gospel Here's my definition of the spirit of revelation. Here, here's how it works for me. It goes like this. When did that verse show up? That's the spirit of revelation. You're, you're like, I've read this chapter or this book so many times. When did that verse show up? That's the spirit of revelation. And when these seven thunders uttered their voice, we're going to go, whoa, <laughs> it goes, wh when were these things written? And it will give a clearer understanding of the gospel necessary to reach the most hard-hearted generation in human history and to prepare the church to come into the fullness of who she is, to be a bride made ready. These prophetic messengers, they will be delivered, paragraph A, that will bring the creative word of the Lord to the nations. The creative word, are, they are prophetic decrees that actually shift human history. They establish new realities in the Holy Spirit. They shake and they topple kingdoms. These preachers, the way I like to think of it, it's like the Apostle Paul and Jeremiah together. That prophetic burden of the Lord that we see in Jeremiah, Isaiah, Joel, Habakkuk, and the message that we see in the New Testament coming together, no longer seeing this weird religious divide between the two testaments, but recognizing that it's one book, it's one loaf of bread that brings the fullness of the understanding of Christ Jesus and his gospel. These uh, thunders, in fact, it was Kirk Bennett who pointed this out to me Gosh, back in 99 or 2000, he said something. I was like, that's interesting. And, you know, Kirk, you were right. He said that every time thunder is mentioned in the Bible, it's supernatural. In the Bible, thunder is not, isn't that right, Kirk? Am I still doing good? <laughs> thunder is never mentioned as a natural occurrence in Scripture. And so these seven thunders... It is a supernatural connection with God's divine activity. Number one. Number two, it's something that comes from the secret place. Psalm 81, verse 7, the secret place of thunder. John 12, 29, it is that subjective voice of God that comes to the end time church. And these seven thunders, they do at least three things. Number one, they give messengers insight to prophesy and to speak concerning people, nations, tongues, and kings. Number one. Number two, they will speak of the completion of the plan of God. And thirdly, they will speak of the proclamation of the gospel according to the mystery, as Paul says in Romans 16, 24. These messengers will be living oracles in that they will not only preach the message, but they will embody the message. And what do I mean by they will embody 
the message. In other words, it is, it is so near and dear to them that it affects their life's choices. It's so near and dear to them that it's deeply personal to them. It's why Paul said this very seemingly cryptic phrase. He said this phrase, according to my gospel. He wasn't referring to the fact that he had a version of the gospel that was different than the others that were proclaiming. He says, no. He said, this thing has become a part of who I am as a vessel. When a vessel becomes an oracle, they enter into Jeremiah's dilemma. It is this dilemma where in the midst of pressure, you say, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm done talking about this. I'm not mentioning your name. I'm not sharing the message. I'm going to sit in that small group. I'm just going to sit there and listen and hold my tongue. And the moment I said that, Jeremiah said, he says, his message, his word, it began to burn in me like fire shut up in my bones. And as it began to burn, the man of God that I was, he goes, the more I resist it. And the more it burned, and the more I resisted, and the more it burned, and the more I resisted until I could no longer restrain, and I opened my mouth, and boom, I did the very thing that I said I was not going to do. It's where the messenger becomes a message by way of the choices that they make it becomes deeply personal and they get gripped by it. A messenger consumed with a message cannot hold back under pressure or protest. These prophetic messengers, paragraph C, on page two. They, um, they must enter into the realm of the seven thunders that contain messengers that are designed to empower, inform, equip the church in love and glory, as well as understanding God's end time judgments. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I do not believe that one messenger will have all the insight, nor do I believe that the insight will be contrary to the gospel, but rather it will be according to the scripture. These will be corporately discerned. They'll be clearly seen in scripture. And the Lord releases this dimension of this gracious release of revelation upon the church. We will see them in the scripture in a fresh and a clear way. Again, it'll be according to the gospel. The release of the spirit of revelation, it'll be identified in scripture, it is going to require kingly nobility from the church to search out the scripture to see if these things are indeed so. There's coming a generous release of revelation upon the entire church. In Joel chapter two, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men dream dreams, young men have visions. Men servants, maid servants upon all flesh, they will receive the spirit of revelation, they will prophesy. Now these messengers, they will be raised up in a context of a life of prayer over an extended period. It will take a lifetime for these messengers to be raised up because it takes a lifetime to raise up deliverers. Again, the Lord, paragraph D, the Lord will raise up these messengers in the deserts of fastings, as Luengo calls it, and these divine prison sentences forming in them intense convictions of righteousness. And these forerunners, they will possess an unwavering spirit and loyalty to the Son of God because they have been uniquely trained by the Lord. Now, when talking about a lifetime, there's some of you going, man, I've I done lived half a lifetime. So, you know, where, where, where do I fit in all of this? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because again, there are some of you here tonight 
You're going, you know what? These are the things that the Lord has whispered to me and I've not really heard this talked about. Others of you are going, this is kind of bittersweet hearing all this because I said yes to this before. Like, ah, he goes, I have veered off. And that's okay because in Jeremiah chapter 15, Jeremiah 15, the Lord speaks to Jeremiah. Jeremiah finds himself in a place in verse 16, Jeremiah 15, verse 16, where he remembers the day when he encountered the sweetness of God's word. But then in verse 17 and 18, he finds himself in a very interesting predicament. He finds himself in a place of inner turmoil to the point where he says to the Lord, he goes, Lord, he goes, why are you so unreliable to me? He goes, you're an unreliable stream. He goes, my, my wounds, he goes, they refuse to be healed. He's bringing this complaint to the Lord. And the Lord speaks to Jeremiah, a very surprising word. He says, Jeremiah, if you return, and that's an intense statement. Here this messenger was called to call a people to return and his humanity kicked in and the Lord, and he finds himself in all kinds of, in all kinds of ways internally. And he goes before the Lord, he goes, Lord, what's the answer? And the Lord goes, Jeremiah, now you must return. He calls for the messengers to return tonight. In this season, he's calling for messengers to return. And when the messengers return, he promises you that he will bring you back. He will empower you to come to that place. He tells Jeremiah, and I will bring you back to stand before me. There's that word again. I will bring you in that place of the sweet fellowship of sitting before me and ministering to me and me ministering to you the eating of the scroll and tasting, and tasting the sweetness of it. Hey, Jeremiah, if you return, because I will bring you back. Number one, number two, I will cause you to stand before me. This is number three. Here's another thing you need to do, Jeremiah. He goes, you need to take the precious from the vial. There's this areas in your life where you have come into agreement with things that I've taught you not to come into agreement with. If you break your agreement with, the, with those things, remove the precious from the vial, he goes, then I will make you my mouthpiece again. I will make you a mouthpiece. And then he says, Jeremiah, here's the other thing. You need to remember, you must not turn to them. Have them turn to you. He goes, don't look at this group and that group and this group and that group because they, they all have got different assignments. You know what? And there even are assignments from me, but it's just not your assignment. You must not turn to them. Have them turn to you. If there's gonna be any turning, let it be from them to you. You stay the course with what it is that I've told you to give yourself to. And I believe that is part of what he is inviting IBKC in. He says, IBKC, don't turn to them. He's like giving you a very clear assignment. He goes, stay in the pathway. I will strengthen you in that pathway. The next thing the Lord promises Jeremiah, he says, I will strengthen you. I will make you a fortified bronze. Isn't that amazing? He goes to the messengers who said, yet, who said yes in the yesteryears. He says, return to me, number one. He goes, I will bring you back, number two. Number three, I will cause you to stand before me. He goes, now what you need to add to this thing, he goes, take away the precious from the vial. He goes, and then he goes, you will become my mouth. He goes, don't turn to them. He goes, I will strengthen you. He goes, and I will deliver you. He goes, you will complete the task that I've given you and I will deliver you until that day. If 
Paragraph three, page three. Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 and 4, we see the seven thunders utter their voices. So we're going to give just a real quick breakdown of Revelation chapter 10. And these voices, they'll be unlocked as the, uh, the end of the age draws near. It will give clearer insight into the full counsel of God. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 20. It says, in that day you will understand perfectly, Jeremiah said, the thoughts and the intents of God's heart. Paragraph B, the seven thunders, they proclaim the realities related to the completion of the mystery of God or the plan of God, the completion of God's purposes. Paragraph C, these messengers must live life of eating the scroll. Though there will be many pressures, but a life of study and meditation, giving ourselves to the word of God. It's absolutely essential. Now, paragraph four. This angel, he carries, as I mentioned earlier, these, these truths, these realms about the nature and the character of God. Paragraph B, he's a mighty angel Speaking of the, I believe, the angelic activity that is released in the life of the messenger, some seen, some heard, some not seen or heard, but there is an increase of angelic activity happening in the life of the messenger. Paragraph C, the angels close with the cloud, the realm of God's glory and God's beauty, and messengers need to be captured, inwardly, inwardly preoccupied and fascinated with God's grandeur and splendor, God's beauty. Paragraph D, he has a rainbow around his head, the realm of God's mercy, understanding his, his grace in a generation of abounding sin. Again, Revelation 9, 21, be the darkest generation. And yet having, in that moment, having confidence that God can break through and touch people with the gospel and turning them to the Lord, understanding God's mercy. Secondly, it's understanding God's mercy in the face of God's severe judgment. So it's understanding God's grace and mercy for the most hard-hearted generation that God is pursuing. And secondly, it's understanding God's mercy in the face of God's severe end time judgment. Paragraph E, the angel, his face, it was shining like the sun. The revelation of the knowledge of God, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. The experience of the knowledge of God. The call of the messenger to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. I love what it says in Psalm 34, verse five, that those who look on him will be radiant. Confident, they will not be ashamed, it says. In other words, confident in God's love, confident in who God is in the midst of all the dynamics that are taking place at the end of the age. His feet are like pillars of fire, steadfast in the proclamation of his judgments, zeal for righteousness, holiness, and love. Paragraph G, he set his feet on the sea and on the land. Don't get time to get into it, but it's God confidence in God's sovereign leadership and understanding God's purposes and plans. Here it is for why he puts certain world leaders in power. There's an understanding of that. David understood why Saul was in power. Isaiah understood why God was gonna put Cyrus in power. The apostles understood why Nero was in power. They understood, they had, they had understanding. They weren't turning to Fox News and CNN to figure out what they had to say and put a couple of Bible verses on it. 
They understood God's sovereign leadership and the purpose for why world leaders were put in place, why different ones were put in place and why different ones were removed. Let's go to page nine. I believe that these seven thunders are related to the completing of the mystery of God. Revelation chapter 10, verse seven. In the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, when, when the, okay, it's, it's not page nine. <laughs> I'm sitting there just having a good old time. And then, <laughs> Page four. The atmosphere shifted and people started talking to each other. Okay, what happened? <laughs> and we're like, the problem is me. <laughs> Seven thunders. They are related to the completion of the mystery of God. Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. In the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet when the mystery of God is completed. I'm gonna give you a little list of what I see in terms of the mystery of God in the, in the New Testament. I, 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 this is not exhaustive, but, when, but I believe that when Revelation chapter 10, verse seven talks about the mystery of God, is referring to the seven, the seven elements of the mystery of God that are highlighted in the New Testament throughout the epistles. In paragraph C is the convergence of heaven and earth, Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. It's the fullness of God's glory being fully manifest in, in, in the entirety of God's created order. First Corinthians, First Timothy 3.16, we would come to an understanding of the glory of the incarnation that will absolutely blow our minds. Understanding the fullness of Christ. Colossians 1.27, understanding the the full implications of the indwelling of Christ. Uh, Paul in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, 127, he says that it was his desire and he was laboring to make known among the nations God's desire to dwell inside of the heart of Gentiles. The implications of that are vast. The one new man. Ephesians 3, 9, and 11, understanding the fullness of a unified church, Jew and Gentile together, one in Christ. The mystery of Israel, salvation, Romans eleven twenty five 25 to 26, understanding the centrality of how Israel is the apple of his eye and his purposes for that people at the end of the age. Coming to a full understanding of that. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, uh, 51, the glory of the resurrection and the resurrected body. When talk about the resurrection, it's not just referring to the body, it is about the entirety of the universe being swallowed up in the life of God. It's what Paul refers to in Romans eleven fifteen 15 when he talks about the whole world being brought back from death to life. Paragraph I, last is we have the worship team come up. The great mystery, the bride of Christ, understanding the glory and the dignity to rule and reign with Jesus Christ, the bridegroom king. Messengers must live lives, paragraph six, conducive for the eating of the scroll. So I give it to you, one, two, three. The angel tells John, he commands John to take the book. In other words, as messengers, God is calling messengers to be responsive, number one. Number two, John says, give me the book. In other words, he's praying for the receiving of the revelation of the book. Messengers must be receptive, responsive, receptive. Then, he, then John goes and he takes the book. Messengers must be intentional. I find it interesting that the angel doesn't just give him the book. John has to go and take it. The book. He has to be intentional about it. Responsive, receptive, intentional. And then he eats the book. He begins to experience the sweetness of the book. 
and entering into the sweetness of intimacy with the Lord through the word, but then there's the bitterness because the implications of what it is that he's experiencing in God's heart through the word are, uh, are weighty to the messenger. And lastly, proclaim. Messengers are to be responsive, receptive, intentional, communing, and proclaiming of the message of the gospel. Paragraph F, I like what the Lord tells Ezekiel. He tells Ezekiel, when he tells Ezekiel to eat the scroll, he tells John to eat the scroll, he tells Ezekiel to eat the scroll, and he tells Ezekiel a very interesting phrase. Here's what he says. Eat what I give you. In other words, don't pick and choose. Eat what I give you. The entirety of the scroll is to be eaten by messengers. The entire, not, not just our favorite parts, not just the spirit bump, the ones that give us spirit bumps. I learned that phrase the other day. But even the parts that really cause us to wrestle on the inside, go, Lord, oh, I don't know. Is it really? It was, yes. Eat what I give you. Don't just eat what is popular. Don't just eat what's gonna get likes on Instagram and YouTube. Don't just eat what is going to invite you to conferences. Don't, don't just eat what's gonna give you a profile. You know, it says in Proverbs 25, it says that a faithful messenger refreshes the heart of his master. That's what messengers do. It's they proclaim a message that is consistent with the heart of God and when the Lord hears it, oh, it just brings so much joy and delight to his heart. It refreshes the heart of the Lord, so to speak. That's what God is looking for. Faithful messengers, those who have eaten all that which God the Father put on our plate to eat from Genesis to Revelation and enjoy the sweetness of fellowship as that sweetness begins to turn into understanding the implications of what it is that he's saying. And then he calls them to proclaim what it is that they've heard in the secret place of his thunder. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You could have done it in all manner of ways. And yet you've chosen one of them to be calling a people to partner with you and to say what you are saying. What a privilege. Thank you, Father. Father, I ask you right now, Lord, Lord, that you would touch our hearts. Lord, that you'd mark our hearts in a fresh way. 